This week's episode of Modern Art Family Tree is brought to you by the Foster Gallery. The Foster Gallery is a gallery in Worcester, Massachusetts, who specializes in paintings, drawings, and prints. Find them at www.thefostergallery.com. Hey everybody, this is Matthew Foster, and this is the latest edition of Modern Art Family Tree. I'm joined again this week by with uh, Dennis Hart. How are you doing, Dennis? I'm doing well. How are you? Not too bad. And today we uh, we uh, we're not quite to La Trek because we talked about that last week a little bit, right? But um, but we're doing Degas, who I'm a huge fan of, um, and I'm I'm sure you like him too. I mean, I, I'm a, I actually am a very big fan of his as well, but but more uh, a certain aspect of his work than than other, you know. But we'll oh, talk about we'll that. Have, we'll have to get into that. Yeah. So uh, so Degas was. Um, a uh, contemporary, well, he was a little before the impression. He's kind of the weird overlap guy, right? Where he's he's a little before the impressionists, but he he definitely overlapped with the president. Pres- right? He was an older guy in the impressionist realm. Let's put it that way. You know what I mean? He was kind of with Man A and more in his time frame, where he was a little bit before. Um, and and the common, but he outlived like you know that time frame in general also but, he lived until but it's also important to say though that he he did not see himself at all as an impressionist in fact he he didn't he if he knew that people associated him with the impressionist he would have been you know upset about that i'll just yeah, put I, it that way that is very true i he was uh he did not see himself that way he he saw himself as a person who was um exploring more the the realism and, and the future of realism uh, you know what I mean? An extension of the Corbets and the, and the actually, uh, what Delacroix and Ang were like his heroes, right? Uh, yes, yes. So, and, and I would I would say, especially when you look at like his earlier work that we'll bring up here in a minute, that he's a pretty good homogenization of those two. I mean, he's got um, he's definitely got the color and the and the uh, somewhat romantic aspects of the Delacroix. But you can tell that, uh, especially in the portraits, he was definitely influenced by Ang, like quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and and then granted, uh, you know the the thing that everybody always knows about Degas that we will eventually hit in this conversation is the ballerinas, and and um, how he definitely loosens up. Um, and that's another thing though is that you know, like even the ballerinas, he had tight you know tight ballerina paintings, and then he also had very very loose ballerina paintings. So he kind of runs a variety of styles as he as he lives on. But well, I think some of that has to do with his. He he talks. I've read um, quotes of his about how he he was like one of the least spontaneous people, or um, so nothing he did was off the cuff. So so some of the some of that I think is due to how much he put into each, and that just goes to show you, you know, those more finished, less loose looking paintings are obviously the ones where he uh, where he spent an enormous amount of time on where the looser ones are probably him think getting his thoughts together and doing they're probably part of his planning you know since again there's no real spontaneity to his work or so he says and off of off of that i mean we he's one of those guys that there's a lot of his work captured i mean he he's not one of those guys that you only see his finished pieces there's a you can find tons of Degas sketches you can find tons of drawings and things like that of Degas. i mean I, i have quite a few that, that I've queued up when I was looking around on the web. Um, and you see different renditions of the same subject matter that he reworked over and over again also. Right. Well, in some of that, I read um, that he, I th- you know, we talked about the ballerinas. Uh, he, he, he could sell those. And, and that happened to be at a time in his life where his one of his brothers had sort of brought the family to bankruptcy. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so, he, so he did a lot of these ba- ballerina paintings because he knew they would sell and he knew he could, he could, he needed, he needed it, you know, kind of like yeah. the, uh, the, the Daumier stuff where he, Daumier had uh, work he did strictly for income. Um, I think that uh, Degas, even though he was fairly wealthy in the beginning, uh, was brought to a point where he needed to rely on, on uh, his own income. Well, that's a good point. I mean, just just the kind of framework that we've brought in with all the other painters. I mean, he was a artist that um, was well from a wealthy family, right? Mm-hmm. And and never, I mean, in his earlier stages, 
never really had a huge problem with you know desperation for money or anything like that. Um, was definitely well educated. Uh, traveled in good circles for the most part. Um, one one characteristic that's definitely a Dagar characteristic that we will definitely bring up is um, his his uh, perennial bachelorism, <laughs> right? Or, but he he was the he was a outspoken um, person about not having a wife and being a bachelor for his whole life, and and you know a lot of his quotes you know lean towards well I want to be fully committed to doing my work I, I you know I couldn't live with myself if I always judged myself because my wife didn't understand what I was doing things like you hear a lot of quotes from him like that mm -hmm. um, and then of course there's always the speculation because he didn't have a wife was he gay or was he you know the other one that you always hear was he impotent or was there something like that or did he hate women you know that kind of thing and, and none of that's really I mean I think the the impotent one is the only one that I've heard as a real thing that someone could could try to investigate. The other stuff is just people talking, because um, he certainly portrayed women, you know, throughout his whole career, and 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 obviously people read into that a lot, uh, and he had women around him a lot. But I mean, one of the things that I had read was, you know, he was that guy that was so uh, he was very 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 traditional, very uh, conservative. And one of the things that I read was that he kicked a model out one time because he found out she was a prostitute. Um, yeah. Um, no, not a prostitute, a Protestant. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. did I read it wrong? I think you read it wrong, yeah. No I Because mean, he definitely painted prostitutes. And maybe he kicked some of them out, too, if he if he found out that. But I think there's there's, there's some of the work, you know, models he used and, and such, I think... <laughs> We'll get. I, I think we have to spend a lot of time talking about what I'm about to say here, so so yeah. we'll come back to it. But you know, his the, the one of the great things about his work is that it's 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 I want to say illustrative, or it's uh, there seems to be stories involved with what he was doing, right? Yet people dug through literature and things to find what stories he's trying to represent with some of this, some of these things. And uh, you know nothing it turned up nothing. So it's so to me it's it's that that it's that's one of the great things about his work is that it it allows the viewer and this of course is a very modernist thing, right? It's it's like what it is to the viewer. They yeah. take on their own or the, what they bring to it is part of what they take from it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So you yeah. look at a, one of his pieces, uh, more maybe more of his later pieces where he got into the social things, um, but you have to. You have you you immediately start thinking. What is this woman thinking? What is she doing? What happened to her? Why is she look? Why does she look oh, yeah. like that? And so you go through this whole thing about a story that you cannot, you know, you cannot miss. Yet you can't, you can't create, you can't establish the 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 root and the conclusion of it either. It's like one of those. Yeah. It, it's beautiful to me. I love work where where you have, you know free reign to come up with your own story to it and well, a lot of his work is exactly that and I have drops, to believe he drops it's you by into design. the situation you know I mean just to just to drill into that a minute he he always has this effect of dropping you into like a situation in the middle somewhere right where exactly exactly where it's That's not it. you, it's you not, can't know the beginning and you can't know the end but you, you know there's a lot around it yeah and it's not and it's not like this theatrical staged piece where you're like oh this is the battle of this this right. is when we crown the king what he's getting is that's what you know like today it's the snapshot thing it's the oh my god I caught this guy and he almost tripped on the curb you know yeah. and a lot of Degas and as we bring up the pieces I mean we should just go ahead and do that but you know a lot of his stuff the first one is not a good example but anyways is that um, you know a lot of his stuff is really about that and, and he even said this at the end of his life he said he was looking for those keyhole moments like he was peering through it was a private moment to the person involved and you're kind of voyeuristically seeing it you know mm -hmm. um and, and again we can talk about that when we see this stuff right. you're yeah, right I, There's I, definitely... the reason i brought it, that into it was because the, one of the paintings that he did i don't even remember the name of it and i know it's not one we're going to look at but uh they talked about whether or not the the model he used for it was a protest uh prostitute or this or you know and it's like most of most of which they never they were never able to 
figure out. Right. Yeah. So that's that's kind of where I was going with that. They they they, they <laughs> he, he was very elusive in that way. I think you know how he did oh, things, yeah. who he used for them, what he what he was doing. Um, but I did but I did read that he had fired a model after learning she was a Protestant. Protestant. I'm glad Protestant. you I, I'm glad you read that also because I I must have been breezing through it and I thought that was like wow that's that's pretty impressive since that you know. There were lots of artists drawing and painting prostitutes all over the place. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he must not have got along very so that, well with uh, Toulouse Lautrec, right? <laughs> yeah, that, that's definitely a different uh, spin on the sentence than what I read. So that's good. So let, let's bring up the first one, which is the the um, family portrait, which is the the Balili family, right? Yeah. And this is a this is an early early portrait painting um, of Degas. And I gotta say, this is one of my favorite paintings of Degas. To be honest with you, um, it, it's kind of a, a very traditional painting at the time. It still has a, a lot of clever storytelling to it. Um, it's obviously portraiture. the The woman was a relative of him somehow, right? Like a like a cousin or an, or a, something like that. And uh, this was her family. The husband was a baron, and uh, it was. Um, uh, they were in Italy when this was done, and uh, from what I understand, you know, he went and visited them in Italy, and then and then really came back to France and kind of did up the full portraiture. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, talk a little bit about the structure and stuff of this, Dennis. I mean, there, there's a lot to this, obviously, but what what what's your feeling there? All right. Well, I mean, this and this is sort of what, the way I like to do this is I I, I I know there's always you know this is such and such a family and there's like a whole yep. historic thing to it. But what we what we as viewers are left with, of course, is just a picture of a family. That's right. Um, yeah. So I like to actually look at the painting for what it is, and 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 it's really. I mean, I don't know how often you see a portrait of a family where one of the members has their back turned to you, but that's certainly a fairly uh, a unique stance or a unique. Uh, presentation so to speak of of, yeah. of a portrait and that's that's important to point out because again i i have to believe that this is something they got was always looking to do you know he's always looking to forgive me for my uh, computer sounds beeping in on us but uh i think he was always looking to to do something uh slightly unusual you know nothing jarring so to speak but just enough to make you think hey well that's a little bit different you know Yep. And so I think having a, the 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 father or or the male figure with his back turned to us, looking over that way was a really a really interesting way to present it. While while the mother and the children are kind of, I mean, the mother's standing there very proper and 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 stern looking. You know, the girls look like girls would. You know, one leg hanging off the chair, uh, hands crossed across the, the, the midsection. Yep. So that's very traditional looking in a sense. But yeah, he has to kind of, you know, throw the other into the mix, which I find in a lot of his work, things like that, little little bits like that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I uh, I agree with you, is that he, he definitely uses the space very interestingly. It, it, there, there's never a boring moment in this painting. Right. Even though it's just people standing around, the, the painting's a very active painting regardless. You know, you're, you're constantly looking at different things. Every time you move your eye, it's a totally different color, totally, totally different shape. There, there's a lot of activity happening. And um, if you wanted to read into things you could, I mean, what does it suggest if the, if the dad's the odd man out, if the, if the you know, you know what, 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 what could this mean? I, I personally don't want to dig too deep into that, but I, I do... I do wonder if there wasn't some, you know, if there wasn't some thought behind it. Well, yeah. Well, I can tell you that part because <laughs> I do know because I know a lot about this painting. The, the, yeah, the the father was uh, kind of obsessed with his work, and uh, and was kind of always distracted from the family. That was one of the that that's one of these suggested, um, you know, knowledgeable things that they that they knew they all had written about and stuff like that because he was related to the woman. Um, he was aware of their fan. They were going through some family issues at this point, um, and then also she's in black because the father died recently, the the grandfather to these kids, obviously, and uh, that's actually a sketch of him in the background in the frame. Oh. So there's some link in there too, you know. But but I agree with you is that even if you don't know any of that, 
there's still a lot of there's a lot of storytelling that you could pull out of this. I mean, just her facial expression alone, the, the mother, kind of has this very like, you know, I mean, there's a lot going on there. You're not sure if she is bored or if she's just totally upset with her life. She's not happy. By, right. by no I doubt. Mean, I, you know, any man who's seen that face before knows that that's not a good day, right? But and see, this is where you get into the whole what I was mentioning about Degas earlier. Now, now you mentioned that this is this is where where knowing too much can actually take away from the painting in some ways because you, you know that she's dressed in black because she's just coming from her father's funeral. Well, you're not going to look very happy when you come home from a funeral. Fair but if enough. you know the family situation, or even if you don't, I mean, you see a family. I mean, this is this is again as as a as a not 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 can't claim anymore to be an ignorant viewer but as a as a as a just a random person walking up to this painting sure. at a museum i would i would see there is something going on with this family right this woman yeah. doesn't look happy these girls look like little girls but they look like they're a little bit uh, you know onto something and this dad's got his back turned you know you, you're wow. already starting to feel a strange dynamic that the that the artist had to have intended by the way he's presented it yeah no i agree I agree. And I'll tell you, of all that stuff we just talked about, and even now looking at it, I, I actually had this painting as my wallpaper on my computer for the longest time. And to this day, one of my favorite aspects of this painting, and it's not actually the one that I'm going to get a better one for when we post this, because this is a little, this is a little um, flat as far as the representation of it that I sent you. Mm -hmm. But that the wallpaper in this painting is this beautiful blue. And and the the way the wallpaper is painted is just like it dazzles you, you know. And that's something that we're going to see. He's very good at with these. He does a lot of interiors, right? He does a lot of interior scenes, and he's one of these guys that really focuses on how to use the planes of the wall and the floor or the ceiling and the wall, and really um, capitalize on those things. To that and, note, to it, I mean, we talked about the impressionists. He uh, he sort of belittled, or, or you know, he poked he poked at plein air painting. You know, it was yeah. like he he wasn't a, a fan of that. So when you talk about doing interiors and things, now he did do some outdoor work, but I'm sure it wasn't uh, you know off the cuff, sitting out enjoying the open air. Um, yeah. you know, well, I can't horse really think of, I mean, and whatnot that he did are, are obviously outdoors, but for the most part, you're right. He's more of an interior painting, and and it, it's it. It's definitely more his strength. Yeah, I mean, outside of outside of the races kind of paintings, I, I don't really know much. I mean, I certainly can't think of any landscapes that he's done. Right, that's that's it. I think of the horse the horse races ones. That's about all I can think of that are outdoors. Yeah. Okay. I mean, there so, may be so others. I, mean, I, I don't want to like say that I know every single painting he's ever right. done, but the yeah. ones that I recall being outdoors were all of horses. Yeah. Uh, no, I agree with you. I think that that's the only ones I can think of also. So let's let's bring up the the second painting, which um, you want to do the absinthe one. Oh sure. Let's talk about the the absinthe drinker. And um, this was actually your pick for the show, which which was great because I didn't even think of it, and it's a fantastic painting. Why don't you go ahead and talk about it? Yeah, well, I mean, again, going back to the whole thing, with there's always a story, right? A story that yet yeah, no, nobody will ever. <laughs> truly be able to know it's kind of you have to bring your experience to this painting and and what you what you can recognize out of this will will help you piece things together i mean there's this this expression on her face there's there's uh you know there's obviously a whole story to it you know i i say you fill in the blanks yeah. but the thing that really really strikes me about this painting is how unusual he again has composed it with with that table in the foreground, you know, coming up at an angle on the lower right, and then and then it's sort of you know there's something connecting, like a newspaper, I think it actually is connecting yeah. to the table surface that comes towards her. You know, it's like it's just this amazing, unusual cropping and and, and comp composition that he's used to set this up. Yeah, I mean, I I think that uh, one point that we haven't talked about yet is his. Is influence. He he's one of the very blatant people that you can tell was interested in photography. Well, and we uh, you can't you can't point that out. He definitely is. You can't point that out. In fact, I believe he even used the camera himself. Yes. Um, yeah, I've heard but, that too. 
you, you can't point that out and not point out also that he's also very influenced by, you know, at this time in France, you know, they would get shipments from from Japan that was wrapped, oh. that were wrapped in these beautiful uh, block printed papers. Yeah. And he was really he would collect these these Japanese block prints and, and he was very influenced by that as well. Yeah, and, and that had a that's a very good point because that had a huge structural impact on how these guys would would manage the surface and everything. I mean, the the, the setup of the scenes, and for people that you know, you know, one of these shows we got to actually show some of those. I, I bet you we can find them on the web and and show what they look like because a lot of people probably don't even know what we're referring to, you know. But but they they had a a totally different way of representing space and and how to go back in space because it would layer things and stuff differently. And, um, and sort these of an guys atmospheric perspective as well as a linear perspective, right? I mean, right. they would, they would use, uh, well, I guess atmospheric suggests a focus in and out of focus. Um, but also, you know, the scale of things going back in space. Right. So, but it had more of a zigzag pattern than, mm -hmm. than what European, you know, imagery had. And even in this, you see some of the zigzag as far as the, the you know the alignment of things um, feeding you back into the space you know and he, it's, it's like again very calculated I, I believe it's very calculated yet at the time I mean even to us today I believe we'll look at this and feel like it's unusual you know this, oh, yeah. this cropping this this setup is an unusual one well, um, well I, I'm drawn to the guy with the pipe who's literally like you know an inch from the canvas but he's staring off into nothing right and yeah. and there's obviously more to the story happening somewhere else, and uh, and you know obviously the main character is this girl who looks obviously you know very depressed and and not exactly her best day, and she no you know what I mean <laughs> yeah she's got this nice hat on as if she were dressed you know dressed up to be there, it's like she got bad news yeah <laughs> like what yeah. she got there you know. And then you got this guy who, who, because she's sitting so close to him, you're assuming they're there together, and he's, like, just staring off on his own. Like, he just doesn't care, you know? He almost looks kind of seedy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. So, um, but, yeah, this is – I think that we're going to see, and even in some other ones I'm about to bring up, you know, you're going to see this, this cropping – and cropping, I don't know if that's the right word because he's not actually cropping the image – but the placement of things for Degas has a very unique flavor because he's not a he and this is where the interest in photography for those of us who who think of snapshots as well it's not centered but it's an interesting photo you know that kind of thing mm -hmm. he 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 kind of uses that to his advantage i think and this was definitely at a time where that was not normal um, but but you have in some of the like the the ballerina paintings and stuff you have this big massive opening of, of wood floor that no one's on and then you'll have like two ballerinas way up in the corner or something mm -hmm. and you'll be like well that's for a painter who is not exposed to a lot of a lot, you know who's used to seeing theatrically staged scenes right you that's put, a it, you put the subject in the center or very close to the center of the of the of the uh, frame exactly right you know you, you would think that everything would be centralized in some way it's nice. This is nice because she's sort of, you know, north of center and and to the right, where the guy is even to the right of her, or to yeah. our right of her, her left. And so it, it really creates an imbalance that way, right? And and especially how you have again in the foreground, you know, to the to her right or to our left, there's no people, you know. When it comes down, you yeah. follow those tables down to this other table in the foreground. So, so the way that he's balancing it out is actually through this, the objects on the tables. Exactly. I was just going to say the only the only thing that saves it is this is this big, almost abstract table on the front. You know what I mean? It kind of weighs it down and keeps yeah. it balanced. It's funny how that works, isn't it? And it the is. other thing that has always been funny to me about this is the two tables that they're behind feel like they're floating, like they don't. You don't see a stand. Right. For either of them, yeah, you know what I'm saying. His legs are. His, his yeah, you would think that his leg would be touching a stand, but I don't <laughs> see one. There isn't one there. You're absolutely right. Unless it's got that sort of angled back type of you know uh, 
I don't know. I, I think I think that you're just assuming that the it's there somewhere, but he doesn't really paint it anywhere. Right, right. So it's kind of a science fiction tables, floating tables. <laughs> are they connected to the bench somehow, like going yeah. back at an angle so you don't see it? Are, are the tables incredibly long so that the, the, the thing that's standing them up are just out of the frame? I, I, I don't know. Yeah. So, so anyways. Um, all right, let's go to another one here. Let's do... Um, what makes sense next? Let's do at the um, at the bourse, which is at the stock exchange. You want to do that one? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. Um, this one, I mean, and I gotta say, I I haven't seen this one in a while. I, I remember seeing this one back in the day. And is this? I'm trying to remember, is this a this is a mid to late painting for him, right? This is like an eighteen eighties type painting, I think. Um, I I don't know. But, but I'll this see is if one I can dig it up while we're here. Of, I, I, I'm guessing by the look of it, it's fairly late. Yeah. Just because it, areas painted. of it are very loose. But I don't know a lot about that particular painting. So you Area, might have to take the floor on this one. No, that's fine. This painting is, is uh, he got in trouble for this painting um, because of the, uh, and to look at it, you would say, well, how, how the hell could he get in trouble for this, you know? Um, but it was because of the the character in the middle is based on a popular caricature at the time in the newspapers of a Jewish man, and it was a it was a theme at the time. It was a it was a slander at the time, if you will, to have this you know Jewish corruption in the in the stock market, like you know um, taking advantage of the money situation and closing out the corporate. Uh, you know, bank situations in France, and it was kind of a, a slanderous uh, conversation that people would have. And then, some, you know, anti-Semitic and Semitic and, and those kind of things were kind of a hot topic uh, at the time because of a court case that was going on, right? Because of um, Dreyfus affair, the, tri the Dreyfus like affair. It was the Dreyfus affair, right? Yeah. And the story behind the Dreyfus affair was that he was an army officer that was basically falsely accused of, of uh, giving away, you know, country secrets, right, to Germany, and was put into exile on Devil's Island, and then was exonerated, like, years later, they found the real guy who did it, and then it turned into, like, this big, long court case that was, and, and it created this very uh, big you know, like cultural clash from people that were basically pro um, Dreyfus, right? And and anti Dreyfus. And uh, it was a very Semitic versus anti Semitic. I mean, there's no way really around it. That was really what the conversation was about. And um, this is where the conservativeness of, of Degas, he was not a person that was often on the part of liberating people and stuff. So he was. Um, a, very much anti Dreyfus, and this picture was kind of his. I mean, I don't know. It had to be intentional because this has some very obvious references to it. But uh, but it basically made a splash as him being anti-Semitic to a degree, right? Right, and and he and he turned out to be just that, yeah. Yeah. Later in his life, he basically admitted to that, right? Yes. Yeah. In fact, I think you know, it, it, you know, we talked about him. He had painted uh, some Jewish models, and but later on he would refuse to do so. Yeah, yeah. Which, which I mean, you know, and and this kind of comes back to Dennis. You and I have had this conversation before, where one of my favorite quotes is they called him an old curmudgeon. Yeah. But but he's he was basically <laughs> like a you know he it's was it's the, a good uh, description I think. Yeah, he was kind of like the the jaded old man type thing, you know. Um, kind of whittled away a lot of his friends towards the end of his life, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So, so in this painting, you've got these two guys. Um, the 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 gentleman and the well, they're all on top hats. The, but one of the characters who has the ear that you can see is uh, is a stereotypical popular culture caricature of a Jewish man, and he's apparently getting a secret from this other man on the stockroom floor. On the, you know what I mean, on on the uh, um, on the trading floor. 
and uh, and this was kind of a, a comment of the time of them of, of you know a a Jewish presence in the stock market trying to dominate the stock market and keeping others out and things like that mm -hmm. um, now one thing about this painting just from an aesthetical standpoint is that it's very very loose and then it hones in on a very tight when you get to the I mean probably the most descriptive painting part is the ear which would make you sense that you need to focus in on that that's where the action is right mm -hmm. well what's but being the, said what he's hearing sure right right the, the the actual dialogue is what you're supposed to be focusing in on and but that's something get, being told to him that no one else is supposed to hear right and you're eavesdropping in on that as if you're as if you're trying to make out what they're saying from across the room or something yeah but the interesting thing to me from a painter's perspective is when you get down to like where their feet are and where I mean even this this block of area that is kind of like a person that's been rubbed out in the in the front here mm -hmm. that I mean I would almost say that this is an unfinished painting you know what I mean yeah it's loose it, for him for sure oh very very loose um, now again it's a later painting so he was already doing you know some of these later you know charcoal drawings I mean not charcoal but pastel and things like that so he was definitely loosening up by this time but um it's kind of interesting to see the tight and the super loose all together you yeah know? yeah yeah because that, that those columns in the back or that wall that's actually not column but that that section of wall in the back is very solid yes yeah and what and then as soon as you see past it and this again goes into him having to have seen photography is that you get a little bit of a non-painterly blur effect that's that atmospheric perspective I was talking about, right? Things that get far away or that are out of your focus are actually out of focus. Right, and, and as a painter, you would not normally, you would not normally, well, I don't want to say what's normal, but as a painter, you're trained to think of it as a, that that's what a camera would do, but as a human eye, you would rationalize it differently. Right, we've, we've learned now, obviously, through the camera to, to, to put focus on what we want focus on and less focus on things that are off out of out of the you know yeah but as a painter you can you can go around the entire scene and spend time getting clarity to every because as you're painting something you're focusing on it so the way of painting that's that's what makes a painting very different from photography right. and then in a sense that makes this somewhat un unmodern like you know to try to imitate another medium yeah. Um, because because what modernists tended to do was to say I'm going to emphasize what's unique about my medium versus that of any other medium. Right. Yeah. No, I would agree with that. Another thing I, I want to point out because we 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 were talking about this earlier. Uh, you know, I mentioned that that his his family had gotten bankrupt. It was through the their banking business actually. His brother, I guess, his brother must have run into some issues, and so so some of this resentment that. Uh, maybe encouraged or I don't want to say encouraged but drove uh, Degas to do this painting with this sort of sentiment was probably just that you know his, oh, his, the, the fact that his family had had uh, had trouble had lost a business in banking and uh, and gone bankrupt that's a very good point I didn't even think of that but that that is a very good point um, and that's where all these things go full circle, right? The motives, lot, the motives. A lot of times, you know, people who have this kind of, I don't want to say hatred, but you know, dislike, it usually it usually stems from something that's happened to them or their family. And in his case, I have to believe that's that that's this. That's yeah, no, that makes perfect. I never plugged that into that, but that makes perfect sense. Yeah. So okay, well let's let's move on to another one of my favorites, which is the portrait of uh, Manet and his wife. Um, and uh, this is a to me this is a great painting um, this has such a modern feel to it without having any of the real brush strokey you know the, the slap shot kind of modernism that you would expect that, you know no cheesiness to it but the, the fact just the simple fact and this is where we talk about cropping, right? Cropping, cropping, cropping. Yeah. The yeah. simple fact that you're cutting off one third of a person, and you're really cutting off the most important part: their face, their hands, their feet. All right. Right. 
and and really replacing them with obviously as a wall but it's just a, a group of colors going down you know i mean he, he was he was at least careful enough not to just make it one big swatch of paint right but i mean you could easily see a person today doing that right and uh and it still holds together it still doesn't really have any problem with the painting i mean it it, it still works because you you make the assumption that she's behind a wall yeah it's also got that sort of voyeuristic quality you were talking about too right where this is maybe a private moment you know he's he, they're clothed and everything it's not that private but, right, they, right. but they're in the comforts <laughs> of their home and and she's doing her thing and he's he's kind of goofishly if that's a word but relaxing on the couch um behind her and it's like a moment that you just you know you don't expect people to be peeking in on you at and that's and that's really the Dagoth theme i think i mean you see that all the time with Dagoth. they you know i it was funny because as we were getting ready for this i was thinking to myself remember the point we made about man a and olympia and she was drilling into you as the viewer she was you were in her sights right mm -hmm. i can't think of almost outside of some portraitures which are you know which is a seated figure looking at you and they're obviously that's a little different but his interiors no one's confronting you and it, and it adds to this kind of your voyeuristically checking in on a moment that you're really not invited to yeah and they're not even noticing you you're just you're just a fly on the wall Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely fascinating because because it gives his paintings a flavor that none of the other paintings in this time have. You know what I mean? I, I can't. I mean, I mean, you've got the impressionists later, like Monet and those guys who who do their you know wives in the gardens and stuff like that. But they're still because maybe because they're outdoors. This is more personal, I think, to me. This this feels like you're that you're spying on these people. Well, yeah. There's a there's a there's a it kind of addresses the whole public space versus private space thing right i mean a garden is people people make gardens because they want people to see them they they things happen outdoors that are public but yeah. a garden is a public thing and and uh, 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 a living room or a space like this i'm not sure what room it is is a private space yeah yeah so anyways, another great painting. <laughs> I mean, uh, and, and that's really the point that I was getting at with is the cropping and the, and the, and the intimacy, you know? Mm -hmm. let's, um, let's get to, let's do the bather and then we'll do the ballerina last, I guess. Does that work? Or should we? Yeah, because that's, that's time-wise, that makes sense. So yeah. let's do the bather. He, he, worked, he worked in pastels, I think, I want to say to like 1907 or some, some point like that. Uh, which is really late in his life. Yeah. And and after that, you know, worked in in just sculpture for well, another was, five years or something before he died. Um, so it, it, you know, you see work like this, and it's very refined, yet it's it's pastel. Yeah. Which is different, you know, color wise than his uh, than his oil paintings. They're a little more vibrant in a way. Yes, they are. They're definitely more vibrant, and I think they're they're um, it, just the nature of pastel. They're more direct. I think also. I mean, a, a line is a line instead of a swatch of paint. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, and in this case too, I mean, we, we've got kind of to to bounce from the last painting to this one, another very private moment, right? I mean, oh yeah. Someone washing themselves is not something that we generally invite people to come view. Well, yeah, and actually, let's let's talk about that for a minute because the bathers was not a project that he did for like six months. I mean, he did bathers for like ten years. I found some that were that were done in like the eighteen eighties, and I found some that were up until the end of the nineties. So, so this was not like just a quick. Ah, I'm going to do a couple bather ones, and then we'll move on to something else. He actually invested a lot of time in doing a lot of bather. You know, um, and I say bathers, women in. Uh, toilets, women, and, and and when we say toilets, like in the bath, you know, in the room and stuff, but dressing, undressing, and that was actually one of his big points with this was nudes at the time before this. It was considered um, unartsy, I guess, whatever, you know, not not highbrow. Well, to I actually think there's a difference them... between presenting a nude as a as a sort of staged nude modeling for you versus a nude in a private 
moment or a private space. Well, or or doing something that's hygienic at all. Yeah. I mean, they're they're you know the the nude before this was this you know porcelain model with with the you know it'd be like your full makeup ready for my close up type model. And what he was presenting, and at the time, you know, the taking off your shirt. You know what I mean? Um, it's a, it's a very yourself. realist uh, uh, approach because, you know, th th this is probably why, where this comes from. But, you know, throughout time it has been a let's admire the beauty of the nude female figure and we'll do it in ways, like you said, where you present them, you know, as the subject standing there to, you know, it's like what are they lying on a, on, a, on a cloth or uh, up on a model stand, whatever it was, they were sort of presented in a way that was for you to, you know, admire. But there's a whole, there's a whole hidden side to, to that beauty, right? That, that maybe he's trying to, a more realistic side to that, which is of course, you know, women spend hours uh, grooming themselves. I don't. Yeah. I mean, that's that's maybe the more realistic side of it, and 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 he wants to kind of put some attention to that. Well, and I would I would actually go as far as saying that that he's finding a different kind of beauty in it because I think that there's a there's a more um, charged and you know if you're so used to looking at the sterilized nude, right? There's something erotic. There's something more real to you because you, you know, it's like the, you know what, do you know what I compare this to? Is those guys that say, you know, I don't want the cheerleader. I don't want the model. I want the girl next door. Mm -hmm. This is kind of, to me, a little bit like that where guys were so, at the time, the viewer was so used to this perfect sterilized version of, of the Olympia, let's say, right? that there was a neuroticism to the girl that, well, that's really, like, that's like the girl down the hall, you know, like, like I'm, I'm actually witnessing like what this would be like if I was around that girl, you know what I mean? All the time. And it has a different kind of flair to it that was not normal at the time. It was not accepted at the time. Right. Right. And you used the key word when you first described it, which was real, right? I mean, this is what women really do. You know, this right. is, this is not like we want to present this in a way that you wouldn't ordinarily see it. I mean, maybe you wouldn't ordinarily see this, but this is what what women do every day. Yeah, and, and if you, if someone, I mean, and we're, obviously we don't have time on this, but w women someone, and men, I should say, I shouldn't isolate because we all clean ourselves. Yeah, yeah. We, well, but well, to that point though of what women do, a lot of these have women brushing their hair. They have women. There's a lot of there's a lot of when, and you know any guy that's married and all that stuff knows of you know the you know taking their time in the bathroom you know what I mean like that old <laughs> and and this kind of this kind of is a lot of that which is funny to me from day God because he was never married right hey, so hey. it was almost like he had this fascination of something that he never really had anyways it's kind of an interesting spin on it because he, there's a great letter actually that um that Van Gogh wrote to um. God to somebody, another painter. I mean, I'm forgetting right now who the other painter was, and um, basically talking about Degas because he was a fan of Degas, right? And Degas was probably twenty something years older than Van Gogh, so Van Gogh was younger than Degas easily. And uh, they were talking about what the deal was with him and women because it was publicly known that he did not, you know, that he was never going to get married and all this other stuff. And uh, um, Van Gogh was actually jealous of that because, and they were, they were, it was the, the real crux of the letter was about him, you know, if he was into women or not into women or, you know, that kind of thing. Like just guys talking in a letter. Mm -hmm. But what it really revealed was Van Gogh's admiring his dedication to that and how it, how it produced this kind of work. And Van Gogh was basically openly saying, you know, he was, and Van Gogh, Notorious for sleeping with prostitutes all the time and and like do having this crazy kind of lifestyle, you know. Well, and he he you know everybody knows the story about his ear, right? So he he he, he was tortured by w women that he that he fell for as well. Yeah. That's right. So so his whole personal life totally different from Day God, mm. but but he was he was finding a a, a um, 
parallel, I guess, and, and almost wishing that he was more like that because maybe he would have seen women in this way. You know what I mean? That kind of thing was the nature of it. I'll have to send it to you. It's actually a very interesting, interesting read. Mm-hmm. So, so let's get to the final one, which uh, we, we are not, I, I think it's actually against the law to talk about Degas without bringing up a ballerina. <laughs> we already talked about him. We didn't have, we did, we, we, at least we spoke of it. Yeah, we, yeah, that's right. So, so we're clear, <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, now there are, as, as many people know who own a calendar, there are many, many Degas uh, ballerina paintings. And, um, and I picked one for our conversation here. That's a later one, right? It it's a little, it's a little looser. It's got some tonality differences from a lot of the earlier ones. I mean, do you want to speak to this a bit? Well, I mean, I do. I, I don't need to do it right now if you have more to say, but if you if you if you really no, want to open the floor to me, I'll take it. Yeah, I talked too much on the last one, so I want you to take this one. Go for it. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. All right, so you mentioned earlier about his his unusual crumb. Whoops, I'm sorry. Hold on one second. Yep. Sorry about that. Um, you mentioned his unusual croppings and having a lot of floor and all that, and this is sort of the opposite of that, really, because we're not we're not able to see the floor at all, right? I mean, there's they're crowded in there. We've got a cropping of, of half of a, a, a forehead and, and the face of a woman leaning forward. Uh, we've got one centered that's sort of you know touching or adjusting her her straps or her shoulders or something. Um, and I'm not quite sure. It's very vague what they're reaching back towards. Whether it be some piece of furniture, it's it's not like the typical dance studio bar, right? I don't know what it is that they're grabbing. If it's the back of a couch, it, it looks like it looks like a set design, like on a stage. Okay, so all right, so so we're not we're still we're not able to see any flooring to speak of, which is to me very unusual about his uh, from his ballerina paintings because I I always see the floors, and there are some of them I know where they're stretching out and preparing, yeah. right? I guess he did do a lot of work where they're sort of backstage or you know, warming up, stretching, doing all that sort of stuff, which is the opposite of what you see from ballerinas, because they, you, you, when you go to the ballet, you see them out on stage doing the performance. So this is this is uh, maybe again slightly voyeuristic in that manner, but uh, but this one to me is is different because of the fact that it's it's showing so much of them up close as opposed to off in the distance where we're again seeing the floor and um, we're not seeing any of the mirrors. With the bar that they can, you know, put their foot up on or whatever, it's 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 a very different setup. What about the what about the application? Because this is even for Degas, this is a and, and to to bring up some art parallels, you know, I mean, this kind of stuff kind of makes me think of artists later that are like Kirshner and like um, you know, the, this very like the highlights on their skin almost feel like they're caked on you know what I mean there's there's a heavy application of, of the oil pastel um, and, and it's not as it's not as um, it's not chalk pastel this is oil pastel oh, I'm sorry maybe it is maybe it is chalk pastel you're probably right actually um, the, but it's not as uh, marky and that's a horrible word but it, but it's not as scribbly I guess as some of the other ones he's done um, of the ballerinas, and, and there's less about the line outlining them. You yeah, know what it's, I mean? It's um, it's kind of forgive me, Mr. Degas, but it's kind of impressionistic, right? It's it's. Uh, well, there you go. Yeah. It's it's using the color to define the form through the light, and and that's you know, that's a very impressionist idea. Maybe he, as much as he was not a fan of impressionism, it was around him so much that it. <laughs> There was some a process of osmosis, you know, uh, where yeah. he took some of it in. Yeah. Oh uh, no, I I would uh, I believe that that would be true. I, I don't know how he could avoid it. Right. I mean, look at the background, right? Where you're talking about the set design. Go up to the upper left hand corner, just just to the right of his signature there, and down below it, right? This there's some very very loose, sparse mark making that creates this texture. Oh yeah. Um. That's just not. That's not. Typical of Degas, I would, I, I don't think. Yeah, no, I, I agree. That, that is especially that set design. That's, that's very much an impressionist kind of the, the, uh, the old term we used to hear was the impressionist flick, right? The, the, yeah. the flick of the brush stroke to make those, to make those little marks. Mm-hmm. And he was normally not a fan of that. He was usually a, a very traditional as far as mark making goes. Now, granted, this being pastel, different scenario, right? 
but he but he would have marked it out in, the, in you know he would have drawn line to create the the forearms and elbows and and uh, bicep muscles and such and that's not visible here i mean the the woman that's off to the right uh the upper so the higher rightish woman her elbow is up in the air sort of i mean look at the back edge of her her tricep area there it's it's it, it almost becomes part of the background you can't tell where it ends and where it begins because it's yeah. so it's such a vague um i don't know a vague container so to speak of this of the flesh tone it's not it's not outlined it's not a hard edge at all yeah well and even where it meets the other woman's hair it, it's almost like it's got other colors like blocking it out also so you're, you're exactly right it doesn't have any of the fine edges that he normally has also i mean some of the contortion going on here and that's that's also sometimes a popular discussion with the ballerina paintings is that you're seeing women contorting themselves a lot mm -hmm. and a lot of them there's like you said before they're stretching or they're trying to lace up so they're in these awkward poses that are not natural body poses you, you would find yourself either in pain if you were doing that or 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 you know something's wrong with your body unless you're unless you're a ballerina it's a weird thing to be in you know what i mean right and and the one that you pointed out there in the in the upper right of the painting like her as compared to the girl right in front of her the girl right in front of her her arm motions seem somewhat natural and you can see where they're tied together the girl behind her almost seems like there's something wrong like like she's almost contorted in a misproportional way she's trying to trying to prove that theory wrong that it's impossible to lick your own elbow right right, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah that's that's really all we were blowing up to folks that's what we wanted to that's talk been, about today. that that question has been out there for a hundred years can we lick our <laughs> elbow and finally solved it i'm so glad he came along <laughs> so so let's let, let's that's a good note to wrap this sucker up so so um are you saying that if we get to the point where we're talking about licking elbows we must have done we must be we, done we, we've pretty much covered anything <laughs> that the casual observer would want to hear right that's right so so i guess uh our our uh, where does Degas sit in the realm of who we've talked about i mean he's He's kind of the, I mean, people always bundle on the Impressionist. I agree with you that I don't think he really is an Impressionist. I think that he has other things going on in his mind than what the true Impressionist agenda was. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, Impressionism, the, the bulk of the Impressionists were plein air painters, and he, and he truly did, did not, um, had no interest in that. Yeah, and so they were also for, for that From that aspect alone, it's hard, to, it's hard to lump them in as an Impressionist. Yeah, well, and also they were very focused on the science of light. And I don't think, I I mean, some of this speaks to that, but I don't think that was his main focus. I think his main focus was really the social aspects of the privacy. And the, there were there were things going on as far as storytelling of, of the moments of these people in these places and, and what that meant. And a lot of his, you know, documented desire to paint was about, representing modern life and modern, exactly which, which modern is a theme that's come up from nearly everybody we've we've uh profiled so far yeah i mean i would say him and manet are similar sometimes in that regard yeah. but and, and they were obviously friends i mean and, and even mia if you want to go that far yeah no i agree with that too and and i would say if someone said well what kind of painter is he that's really what i would talk about is is his you know, modern interiors, modern life in the city, inside rooms, people in their places doing their things. Mm -hmm. And then the, the real catch for, for Degas is that he was doing it in a way that you were eavesdropping on those lives. So you were seeing them unfiltered. You were seeing them at their, at their dirtiest, but also at their most personal and at their most, you know, um, natural, I guess. Um, and he did it in a way that's that's very elegant, very very. Right, beautiful. it doesn't seem perverse, right? That that's the thing about no. it to me that I find uh, I don't know. It doesn't seem perverse in any way. Maybe back in in his day it did, but it doesn't to to me. No, I, I think it's I think it's a very respectable way to do it. I I think that they're they're not the shock at the time was just to say that. 
was just to actually make those kind of moments. Right. It yeah. was. I, I don't mean, think he, he had to he go. He described full... him as an old curmudgeon, but not an an old pervert. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that should have been on his gravestone. I may have been a curmudgeon, <laughs> but at least I wasn't a perv. <laughs> what a what a proud tagline for Dega. <laughs> At least, at least I wasn't a perv. <laughs> if Dennis and Matt say so. But but no, you're. I I, I agree with the statement. Is that is that he um at, he was respectable with those private moments. Um, there, there wasn't a, and and I could easily see someone later, someone today, going for that more of a shock moment of well that that was just you know you're you're invading and. Not to not to drown out like this with uh, a person from today, but like Eric Fischel. Right? Oh, that's exactly who I was thinking of. That's a great that's a great reference. That's who, that's who, who was on my mind as soon as you said those private moments and things and not being you know over the top. He he is the counter to that. I agree. Yeah, is that here's a person who who did the same exact thing. He caught the private moments, but they were the embarrassing private moments. It was the it was the um, you, and I mean, some of them, the ones I'm thinking of, I would never hang in my home, you know? Right. Like they're, that they're embarrassing, that, yeah. They're that caliber. And Degas never had to do that. And granted, he lived in a time where this was enough. You know, this was shocking enough. So he didn't have to do that. But um, but because of that, they have a good permanence. They have, you. I mean, I enjoy, all, I can't think of a painting of Degas. I sit there and go, oh, I really hate that painting. Yeah, you know? I don't have any of those either. I really don't. There, there's nothing that truly turns me. I, I think they're all, they're all, you know, they're all good. They're all uh, <laughs> digestible. Yeah, well, the, well, well, appreciable. You know what I mean? The, yeah. the, there's a lot to them. So, all right, good. I think that's good, Dennis. Uh -huh. um, I mean, Degas was yet another not easy one. We we had to spend some time on it, but it but it's uh, he's got a lot of great work, and he's another painter that there's just so many good paintings that are Degas. and a lot of museums have many of them. So it, it's a he's a great painter for someone to say. If you love Degas, you can travel around, see a lot of Degas, you know what I mean, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, he, he's, uh, he's, you know, we will see painters that that's not the case, like Soutine. You have to hunt, you know, hard and wide to find Soutine paintings. And and then there's painters like Degas, or like Corot was the same way. It's so many paintings that um, that if someone said, I want to search out and find some, it'd be easy to do. Degas is that kind of guy. Oh, yeah. So, good. Well, thank you very much, Dennis. You're and, very uh, welcome, man. Thank you. Oh yeah, I think that we're we're now there, there's nowhere to run. I think Lutrec is next. I agree. I agree. And, Let's uh, do him and, next. And that's going to be a good show too. So, all right, I'll talk to you then. Okay. Thanks.